Thank you, Father. We honor you today, and we celebrate everything you did for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you just welcome someone? Just shake one or two people around you. Just say happy Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. Just tell him, because he's risen, I am alive. And I have a future. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to welcome you to a wonderful, wonderful service. I hope you've been blessed so far. I was getting jittery when it was my time to come up. I was telling my wife, I don't, I don't want to mess these things up. It's, it's been going so good. I wish I did not put myself on schedule today. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I trust that God has something wonderful for you. This morning, I have a good news for you. There's not a lot of good news out there. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this a few weeks ago. Do you know what we call news? It's just a group of people gather together and determine what is news for the day. They get to pick what they report, right? They get to pick, you know, just a few network, a few guys there. One day, you know, a few hours, they will say, this is what we're going to report to America today as the news. It doesn't mean those are the only things going on in America, right? It, all over the country, there are many other things happening, great things, wonderful things. They can choose not to report that, and we're not going to know about them. So they have enormous power. And a lot of times, unfortunately, they focus on the bad news. But today, I have a very good news for you. Hallelujah. And I'm praying that you will receive that good news. And I'm praying that your heart will be open. I'm going to simply tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story of the Bible in summary. I know many of you here, you want to know, you want to understand what is resurrection all about. Why did Jesus have to die? Why do we even have to celebrate all these things we talk about? By God's grace, that's what I'm going to tell you in a nutshell. And I'm trusting God that he will give you a spirit of understanding. I'm trusting that we will receive that message and it will make your, a, a difference in your lives in Jesus' name. Can we bow down our heads and pray? Father, I'm here in weakness. I'm here knowing that without you speaking, we will walk out of this place without a word and I humble myself and I ask Lord you will speak through me I know in the world we live today there is not a lot of good news many of us are lonely many of us are frustrated many of us are under the weight of sin under the weight of death many of us here have relationship problems Many of us are here yeah, are going through so many things, but we know you have a good news for us. We know you have an answer. After all, you are God. And Lord, I ask you will give us an answer today. You will speak to every single one under the sound of my voice. Thank you because you have answered our prayer. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Easter is the most significant day in the Christian calendar. In fact, it is the most critical day in the history of humanity. Easter divided history into two. If you write a date, you're simply acknowledging that Easter took place. The event we are celebrating today, or this weekend between Friday and today, is acknowledged each time we write a date. We're simply writing 2017 A.D., after the death of Christ. So about 2,000 years ago, Jesus was crucified. The Jewish leaders, motivated by greed, jealousy, and whatever things, anger, whatever was motivating them, decided that this man called Jesus must be put to death. 
they didn't know they were being used by the devil anyway, but they decided Jesus must be crucified. And they found a way somehow to get Pilate to deliver a judgment on Jesus Christ. It was a false judgment. And after a series of trials, you know, with conniving, with all kinds of bribery, all kinds of things going on, Jesus received a judgment of death. And on Good Friday, which was, we celebrated last Friday, was a horrible Friday for him, Jesus was crucified. But praise God, the story did not end there. He was crucified, he died, he was buried. But as Jesus told his disciples, on the third day, which is Sunday, he rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. But what we are celebrating this weekend would not be as significant without another significant event that happened 4,000 years before that, which is 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago, the most unfortunate thing to human history happened. It is simply called the fall of man. You see, when God created us, according to the Bible, he created us for a very wonderful purpose. Life was meant to be beautiful. In fact, I'm going to, go, I'm going to take us to the book of Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read a few verses there to see the account of God. What was in God's mind when he created the human race, all of us? In verse 26, then God said... Now, God was talking to, a lot of people have stories, I don't know, feelings about that, or theories about that, rather. The angels, the Godhead, all the other hosts of heaven. He said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God said, let's create a man. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful. Increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So we see a plan. So God did not create us without a purpose. We, were not, we are not product of accident. See, you're not a product of being banned. It's not something just collided in the, in, the, in the atmosphere and all of a sudden you just existed. If that is what it happened, then ha life has no meaning. But life has more meaning than that. Amen. Amen. So we see God here wanting to express his image. He created us. He created you and I to express his image on earth. He wants something on earth to reflect him. Before then, if you're reading the account, he created the sea. He created light, he created darkness, he created land, he created water, he created animals, he created fishes and all the sea animals, he created plants, and he said, you know what, none of this will reflect me. I want somebody, something to reflect me. He created man. And did you see it here? He created them male and female. So both male and female reflect God. Hallelujah. My daughter asked me, if God has no gender, why do we use he for him? I didn't, I was taken off guard by that question. <laughs> I said, you know, some group of people just did that, decided we're going to use he for him. It doesn't make any difference. Amen. Amen. God is neither male nor female. Can you turn to your neighbor? He's neither male nor female. <laughs> God is God. Amen. Amen. Turn to that person and say, you are made in God's image. Don't let any other person lie to you. 
Amen. God also created man to rule over the rest of the creation. So rule over. So let's, this image of us will now be in charge. We'll be in charge of the sea, the air, everything that I created, we have created. Mankind will rule over. We subdue and dominate and determine its purpose, how they are used, how they are utilized. But the third thing he said here, they will multiply and replenish the earth. Hallelujah. That was God's plan. But God went further. If you go to chapter, I mean this chapter 2 of Genesis, I'm going to read a few verses there. The law in verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to walk it and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God, God went further to say, you know, he decided to set boundaries. God said, you know what, I don't want chaos again. You know, before God started creating, there was chaos, right? There was void, darkness was all over the place, and God created some order. He said, you know what, I want some orderliness. I want some boundaries. And God, he put the man in a garden, a beautiful garden. It's called Eden. He said, your job is to just keep this garden, walk the garden, and take care of the garden. Make sure it continues to look beautiful. Simply put, make sure the earth continues to look beautiful the way I made it. And God said, though, look, you, can, you are free to do anything. I want you to say free. free. God gave us freedom. Gave man freedom. He said, you are free, but it's freedom with boundaries. All right? God did not start with do's and don'ts. He said, no, you are free. Free to eat anything, but just one. All right? The tree, there's a tree called the knowledge of good and evil. Just don't touch this. I'm not going to go into the meaning of that because it's not relevant for now because of our time. And I don't want to confuse you, actually. So God gave them a commandment. You must not eat this. Because the day you do so, you will die. It was a beautiful plan. It was supposed to be awesome. We're supposed to just live forever. We're supposed to enjoy everything God created. There wasn't supposed to be sickness, disease. There wasn't supposed to be accident. There wasn't supposed to be anything. All this evil we see around us, they were, not gonna, they were not supposed to exist. People were not supposed to die of cancer. There was not supposed to be any, all kinds of problems, divorce, relationship problems that we all have, issues that we just carry around, financial challenges. We were not supposed to have all that. It was supposed to be a beautiful, beautiful life. Unfortunately, that plan, that beautiful plan, was thwarted. That beautiful plan was messed up by man's disobedience. And let's look at what happened in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. This actually simply is talking about the devil here. The devil came in form of a serpent that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? So he said, he began, what did he do? He questioned, trying to cause confusion. That's still how he operates today. Try to cast doubt on the truth that you know, right? How many times do we really hold something strongly we believe is true? Then somebody challenges it. Somebody questions it. And even the truth that you know begins to be very blurry. So he said, did God really say, you must not eat from the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit, from the trees in the garden. But God did say, 
you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. And look at verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from, from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So change everything completely. Lied to man, to the, to man through the woman, and that was the beginning of the fall. That was the unfortunate incident that happened 4,000 years ago, I mean 4,000 years before uh, Jesus came. And through this story, through this incident, sin entered into the world. In fact, if you read Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. Did you see that now? So that's the beginning of death and everything in between. All right, from pain to sickness to death, everything entered at this point. That is why everything we see that is bad, that is negative, this is when it came in. Through what? Through that act of disobedience. Sin entered into the world through one man, Adam. And death came through sin. And by this, death came to all people. Because when he sinned, we all sin. Hallelujah. That's how we inherited the nature of sin. And how did God describe that unfortunate incident? God described that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And I want all of us to read it together. Let's go. One, two. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The glory means God's glorious ideal, right? God's perfect plan. We all came short of it. And that is what sin is. Sin simply means to miss the mark. I want you to know that that's how God sees sin. There is a mark. That mark is perfection. We fell short of God's glorious idea, God's perfect plan for us, God's beautiful plan to live forever, to never experience pain, to never experience suffering, to never ever have to think of death, to never ever have to think of anything negative. That plan was thwarted, and we all fell and missed God's glorious ideal. The Bible says, there is no one righteous, not even one. So sin made all of us to fall out of favor with God. But he did more than that. We not only fell out of favor with God, sin put us under the control of the devil. You see, it put the, con it put the control of our lives. As soon as that permission was given to the devil... He took control. So he's now in charge of the affairs of men. Ephesians put it this way, and I'm going to want all of us to read it together, you know, so you can get it clear. Ephesians chapter 2, if it's there, verse uh, 1 and 2. Do we have it? Okay. Let's wait. Okay. Can we read it together? Therefore, remember the formerly... You are Gentiles by birth. No, no, no. I think you're... Are you, re, are you reading the right one? One and two. Okay. And for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. Let's go to the next one. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Amen. So we follow the ruler of the world. We put ourselves under the control of the devil because of sin. And that's un the unfortunate incident that, what hap that happened. 
6,000 years ago. Wow. Can you just imagine how God felt? How many of us have made a perfect plan? This is how you want to go. How many brides are here? You, you, you laid everything down. This is how everything is supposed to go, and something happened. Maybe a bad weather. Or maybe somebody just messed up their dress. Everything was just messed up. But for God, it's worse than that, right? The plan that he has for humanity was just completely turned upside down. But God didn't give up. Hallelujah. So he made a plan. He made a plan. That plan is called the plan of atonement. Now, first, he made a temporary plan. That temporary plan is called the Old Covenant. If you have ever heard of that, many of us who are familiar with the Scripture or the Old Testament. He made a temporary plan on atonement. To say, now, things are broken. My relationship with man is messed up. Man is now taking advantage of. The devil is now in charge. I must find a way of bringing man back. Exodus chapter 29, verse 36 and 37, God said, we can sacrifice. Sacrifice a bull each day for a sin offering to make an atonement. So there was a plan called plan of atonement. Atonement simply means to repair what is wrong. But that plan was temporary because he wanted to really carefully put together another plan. And that plan was taken care of or was culminated in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Praise the name of Jesus. That is God's plan of salvation. God said, you know, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to take care of this completely. I am going to make sure the relationship that was sought on the cross of, I mean, on, at the fall in the garden is repaired. So the plan of salvation is the permanent plan, which is what we're talking about. Hallelujah. I'm going to read a scripture that we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to read together. Hebrews 10.10, 10, if it's there on the screen. Can we all read Hebrews 10.10 10 together? Let's focus on it and read. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Christ once for all time. Now, under the temporary plan, People have to sacrifice. People have to kill animals. People have to sacrifice to make atonement. But because the life of animal is not worth the life of a human being, so that atonement cannot be complete. It's temporary. And it has to be done over and over again. But God's permanent plan of salvation was instituted through Jesus Christ. And it is a permanent plan. And that plan involves a few things. The first thing that that plan involves is called atonement. I want you to say atonement. Atonement simply means to repair what is wrong. God said, you know, we have to repair that. So through the death of Jesus, he sacrificed himself. There was an atonement. Hallelujah. The plan also involves what is called redemption. I want you to say redemption. redemption. Redemption simply means the action or the process of buying back, regaining possession of something in exchange for a payment. It means you are regaining possession of something that was lost. You want to redeem it. You want to get it back. You know, one of our celebrities got in trouble a few years ago, right? Wanting to get his uh, O.J. Simpson, right? He wanted, you know, I felt, I felt bad. He wanted to get something that, that belonged to him, right? This is mine. And, you know, out of passion, he took out a gun. He got in trouble. You know, God said, I'm getting it back. Something that belonged to me. And that is the plan of redemption. So can you imagine God now has to buy us back? from under the control of the devil. And that is really what the plan of salvation does. So, right? Redeemed us. Hallelujah. Yeah. So the Bible describes that as God 
redeeming us, buying us back, so that the enemy no longer has control over your destiny, over our life, over our purpose. Praise the name of Jesus. The next thing that happened, another thing that happened in the plan of salvation is called reconciliation. I want you to say reconciliation. Reconciliation Reconciliation simply means to get on someone's good side, right? You know, the relationship is repaired. Now it's good. It's reconciled. So God reconciled us to himself when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. So that our lives is no longer just, you know, lived without a relationship with God. So there is no longer separation. So you are no longer on the bad side of God. You know, when you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, what God simply did was to reconcile you to himself. Now, that is so powerful because you are the one that offended God. You know, in normal human reconciliation, the offender must usually will initiate reconciliation, right? I did something wrong. You know, I did something wrong against my parent, against my boss, against my uncle, you know, against my wife or my husband. Now I need to reconcile. I need to make sure I initiate a process whereby I get on their good books again. But God wanting to make sure his original plan, you know, come back, he said, you know what, I am going to reconcile man to myself. And that is why Jesus came. Hallelujah. The next thing that is involved in the plan of salvation is victory. Hallelujah. I want you to say victory. Victory simply means we now have victory over sin, over the world, over the power of the devil. When you truly submit your life to Jesus Christ, you have victory in Christ. And that victory is made possible by his resurrection from the dead. Hallelujah! Because Jesus rose from the dead, we now have access to that power of resurrection. Hallelujah! We have access to the power of resurrection. And we can have victory in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So if you are here today, maybe you are wondering, so what is this all about? It's about you. It's about you. Maybe you are lonely. Maybe you are down. Maybe you're feeling sorry for yourself. Maybe you even feel you know, you've done something so bad, I don't think I can ever be on God's good side again. Maybe you just wonder, how can I really, really find peace? How can I really, really know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven? That's a question, right? How can I really be sure after this world, I am so sure that when this world is over, I have a place with him. Now, I'm going to complete that story before I, you know, I, you know, we do the next thing. So God decided, ultimately, this world, this earth that he created, that the devil messed up, you know, I don't need to fix it. In case you're here, you are wondering, why does bad things happen? Why can't God, no, God said, you know what, it's too damaged beyond repair. How many of us have had, your car is so damaged, you go to the mechanic, the cost of repairing the car will buy another car. Isn't that what you would do? Isn't that wise? You're going to say, you know what, I'm just going to maybe just leave it at the mechanic and just walk away. (laughs) And go buy another car, right? That's exactly what God has done. God said, you know what, this world is too damaged and I don't need to be fixing it. In fact, I'm going to destroy it at some point. All right? But before the destruction takes place, I'm going to call people out. Right? Right? That's the plan of salvation. I'm going to call them out. I'm going to reconcile them to me. I'm going to make sure they have peace with me. And at the end of the day, I'm going to get rid of this, and I'm going to make myself a new heaven and a new earth. So that original plan still stands. Praise the name of Jesus. 
It still stands. It, it, it can never go away. It is still part of God's plan. I'm going to invite our dance to do a dance. They're going to do a dance to a song, and I'm going to come back to pray because I know there are a lot of people here, or at least a number of people here, who need to be reconciled with God, who are really looking for that peace, who are really looking for that assurance that, you know what, when I die or when this world is over, I want to be so sure that I'm going to make it to the new heaven and the new earth. I want to be so sure that that beautiful plan that God has, I am part of that plan. I make it to the new heaven and the new earth, and I live with God forever. I'm going to step up the stage for five minutes. A dance, we're going to dance to a song, and I want you to just listen to the words of those songs, and I'm going to come back and really pray for people who want to, you know, give their life to Christ, or just reconcile. I pray this blesses you in Jesus' name.